position and previously in um, management uh, teaching review, uh, where he also serves as an associate editor uh, and in the international term of uh, training development amongst many others, including book uh, contributions and also some really interesting contributions of bridging the space between uh, academia and uh, professions through uh, multiple publications in that area. Um, his teaching is particularly uh, focused in those areas, but also uh, he's long been a leader in the implementation of new technologies in teaching, Padlet, uh, Catme, Twitter, uh, many other uh, technologies along the way, and also in innovations in assessment, uh, most recently introducing uh, Cornell Notes during uh, the pandemic as an assessment method, amongst many other uh, innovations along the way. Some of you may not know his service contributions here in Maynooth, uh, particularly those of you from outside or new to Maynooth. Uh, Paul has uh, served as the head of the School of Business at a really critical time in the development of the school and it was his leadership that introduced, as far as I recall, the first five uh, MSc programs and really the setup of the graduate school here in Maynooth. Uh, amongst many other innovations uh, during his time as head of school. Um, he's also served uh, very frequently on the uh, Irish Institute Training and Development where he's presented his work, bringing research to practice, but also has played leadership roles there uh, since 2010, serving as a judge on the panel for uh, national training awards. So. I could say a lot more about Paul, but it's far more important that Paul speaks for himself about his research. So over to our good colleague, Paul, who, um, as some of you may be aware, is uh, retiring uh, at the end of this year. So over uh, uh, end of this month. So over to Paul. Thank you. Thanks indeed, Peter. Thank you very much indeed for the, the kind words and uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, colleagues. Um, well, welcome to the presentation today on uh, St. Bridget's Day here in Ireland, which is a really important day because it's the first day of, of spring here. And uh, probably the most important person on the call here is, is not me, but um, but uh, a, a young man called Owen Graham, who has just started in the uh, accounting program at the School of Business. And uh, he's a very clever and bright young man, but also he's, um, he's my grand nephew. So I'm leaving him at the school to keep an eye on everything now that I, I'm moving on. So very good luck to him. Um, so let's see, can we share this? So I hope that we're in a sharing mode here at the moment. Um, I hope you can see my slides here. Uh, please note me if you can't. Uh, we can the see agenda, them, Paul. Great. Thank you, Peter. The agenda for today is, uh, this presentation is, I want to first of all refer to some of the influences that brought this piece of research around, um, because they're, they're important to understand where it's coming from. Um, and also I want to take a look at, um, the idea of preparing students for the workplace, because that was instrumental in uh, what I was doing uh, with this um, presentation. And the, the performative element of this research is part of a wider set of experiential learning activities, which I think um, are increasing in their use in the School of Business, which is great. I want to share with you the case study itself um, and look at some of the outcomes, which I think are very interesting. And I'd like also to talk about a few issues with the performative approach and um, maybe talk a little bit about future research and implications. Afterwards, perhaps I, I slipped on a, a recording button just to let people know, um, because some people who can't be here today would like to see it, the presentation later. Um, so future research and implications will be um, will be discussed. As Peter uh, mentions, uh, I come to the school with some levels of experience. One of my um, 
tranches of experience was in operations management. And this um, left lots of marks on me in relation to my understanding of management and of, of humans. And the interesting thing about that was, was I was managing uh, an operating plant uh, for Board Namona, the Irish Peak Development Authority. And uh, it was during its transformation and reinvigoration. And one of the most important actions that happened at this time was uh, the introduction of self-managing uh, teams and units all across the production and transport. And I was heavily involved with that as, as manager, as general operations manager of this plant. And I was amazed at the transformation in individuals uh, when they were facilitated to have more control and autonomy over their work. And it was a night and day. For me, it was an epiphany about the issue of control of human beings and how damaging over control and micromanagement can be for individuals and how enabling and liberating it can be when they actually are, are freed uh, to, to perform to their best and how they can self-actualize. And that to me was an amazing uh, transformation for me as a manager and as a teacher of management it was uh, it left lots of marks and I took that to Manute with me another thing I took to Manute with me was my experience in management development with uh, the Irish Management Institute which and it's an, an organization which believed in leaving people to their own devices which believed in getting that calibration of control really really uh, finely tuned and an organization which wonderfully believed in experiential learning. In fact, uh, I, I had dozens, hundreds of conversations with my colleagues there about design of experiential learning and how this was uh, so enabling for managers. And this was a fantastic experience for me and another experience that I brought to, I brought to Manus with me. Yeah, on my arrival at Manus. Uh, oh, you I, could I do met, the same on yours, huh? I met. Uh, uh, I send you the email link. Okay, so maybe I'll ask everybody to mute, mute the microphone, please. Um, so when I got here, I found some very interesting things. I found some very interesting uh, differences, and it was wonderful to become almost an apprentice again, to bring certain skills to the university, but also to be in some ways an apprentice, to be to to go back um, and recheck my tools and my experience. Um, at this wonderful uh, institution. I really felt at the time when some people were probably thinking of retiring, I was at that kind of age, just to come and, and to regenerate and, and reinvigorate myself again, which was a great gift that Manus gave me. The first thing I noticed, and, and it was a real, a real uh, change and a challenge, was the issue of the large en enrollment class. In my experience as a management developer, the largest classes I ever experienced were uh, something around um, uh, 15 to 16 people. In fact, the norm was closer uh, to 12. And experiencing that in the news was real, a real change. It was, it was um, a real challenge. And, and <clears throat> knowing that I, I, I really had to, had to puzzle this out because I brought, I brought myself uh, a belief as I said, in experiential learning. But how was I going to do this in this setting of large classes? Settings where 300 plus now don't raise an eyebrow. Um, but this was, a, this was something that I set myself as a puzzle. I set myself as, a, as something to be solved rather than something to be put up with. And I've, and I've always said that to myself as a management developer, if you can't do it in a porta cabin in the middle of a peat bog with the rain beating down and the, the, the room leaking and everybody demotivated. If you can't do it there, you, you, you shouldn't really uh, sign up for the work. So uh, blaming your tools and blaming your environment, I, uh, I never subscribed to it. So this was an interesting puzzle. The other interesting puzzle was about student um, passivity. And encountering student passivity was a real uh, also a real challenge for me um, because I wasn't really used to it as a management educator um, working with experience, post experience managers. It was really interesting uh, to note the difference, the challenge you got from post experience managers versus the, the passive nature of many students who uh, their expectation was to sit, 
to digest and then to return the information back to you at the end of the of the module. And it was really puzzling to me, but I, I wasn't that concerned about it because I knew that my experience in um, the operating plant was that I could, I had the tools to turn people around. I had the tools and the knowledge of how you dealt with people and adjusted the controls and adjusted the context in which they worked, that that could be solved. So I was quite quite happy with that um, that challenge. That was really a, um, a fairly analyzable and fairly understandable um, challenge and problem. One that I, I agonized quite a lot about uh, before getting involved in this research was the was what what was I there for? Um, I certainly came to Manus thinking that I was to prepare students for the workplace. Um, a view that I've 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 jettisoned um, since then, and I don't uh, and I don't subscribe to it anymore. Um, uh, but yet I know that the discourse outside of universities is accepts this as a principle. And I know that within universities, we tend to see that as a secondary objective to what we do. Um, I'm captured by what our president, um, President Michael Higgins, talks about in, in, in universities as being the, the preparation for citizenship. And that, to me, has an, a ring of authenticity to it. It's something that I think is um, our objective and our purpose. And I think the, I definitely think that the preparation for uh, the workplace is, is a secondary item. Uh, but hard to gain that, hard to get control of that discourse, I think. Sounding like a sociologist now. Um, but but I'm, I've always kept, uh, as Peter alluded to, I've always kept my foot, um, or at least my eye, on the, the what was going on in practice and what the, the practitioners and the management practice um, houses are saying about the workforce of the future and what we're doing in universities. And I noticed the most recent reports suggest that Deloitte's at least have given up on us, um, that suggesting that third level is not mandated to prepare workers of the future. In a sense, many of us would agree with that. We're, we're definitely mandated to prepare um, learners who are questioning, curious, um, inquiring learners. Um, Good citizens, um, but but the discourse in in the private sector seems to be about uh, preparing them for for trade, preparing them for, and it, this has it impl implications for us. Um, it has it has relevant implications for us because we can't lose that that secondary role of preparing them for for their workplace. But I've noticed in the last um, decade or so an increasing uh, requirement of individuals to be their own uh, training manager and their own HR manager. And the reports from people like Deloitte and other management practices is that when people join organizations, they will be responsible for their own learning. And the new expression by Josh Berson of Deloitte, which is gaining lots of traction, is learning in the flow of work. So no longer can our students expect that they're going to be classed to the bosom of the learning and development function and they will be oriented and trained and retrained in organizations that's not expected and that's not promised and gone are the days when arthur guinness would take us from our womb to our tomb um, nowadays it's going to be being able to learn from experience being able to learn from um, learning in the flow of work being able to reflect upon what's actually happening and being our own uh, autonomous learner, which I think has, has uh, certain ramifications. I see the lifelong learning uh, motif of today as being uh, a, a two-headed Janus in a sense. There's a light side, who can argue with the idea of, of lifelong learning? But on the other hand, there's a shadow side, whereas um, there's almost the, the rejection of, of the employer's responsibilities in these, in these ways. And so with that in mind, uh, I think it's even more important for us. And I brought this, I brought this as a third string to, the, to my research in, in Manus that 
I, I think it's really important for us to repair them as curious learners who can understand and reflect on experience and who can learn experientially to prepare them for this world where they're not going to get the supports that the previous generations have got. And there is going to be that sturdy individualism expected of them in terms of their learning. So this leads me to um, where I came to this research as being um, experiential in nature, but also being performative in the sense that how can I create the motivated workers that I saw in my previous experience? How can I calibrate the control um, and freedoms um, that were there in my experiences of the past in, in seeing motivation of human beings? And so this led me to the idea that there's over the past five years, but there is something to be gained. There's an, a pearl of great price in uh, approaching the learning of students in a much more collaborative and perhaps um, performative way. Obviously, we know an awful lot about uh, performative learning and experiential learning from the, the, the experts um, over the last hundred years. However, I feel that some of that's been hijacked by, in the way it's, it's found its, its presentation and ex, its expression in both corporate and in universities. And that it almost has replicated, the experiential learning that I've witnessed has almost replicated the controls of the organization that we are so much wanting to uh, dissolve. The, the, our, one of our wonderful colleagues from UCD talks about um, the, the uneasiness and the apprehension of people who experience um, experiential learning in many situations. It's like a shadow side, she describes it as a shadow side of um, experiential learning. And that, that has come out in, in much of the literature. But undaunted, um, I, I pursued research and, uh, and literature reviews in terms of uh, teaching and learning. Seeing the performative as being very exciting, liberating, democratic, and with strong hints and suggestions towards uh, an interdisciplinary approach. And armed with this confidence, I uh, pursued an idea and began to use it in my classes uh, from about the, the middle of the decade uh, as, a, as a de facto way of teaching and assessing uh, individuals' uh, performance, etc. And for me, uh, performative is making, it's making learning come to life. It's making something come to life. And it involves immense control on the part of the students. And it's not something I'm giving them. It's something they're entitled to. And it's something that transforms the way they, um, the way they uh, approach their work. For example, they surprised, I, one of the things that had shocked me was that they surprised me in their productivity and in the way they, they innovated. I saw wonderful case studies in um, negotiation where uh, students took to the front of the room and enacted uh, uh, very interesting domestic role plays describing trust in negotiations, describing negotiations between partners, um, using their fellow team members in the audience to stand up and explain what part of the theory that we were teaching was now being enacted. And it, it, I, I would sometimes stare in amazement at what was going on. It was really um, moving to see how engaged and involved they were uh, in these activities. Sometimes they were more um, performative in the sense that, uh, more, more uh, immediate in the sense that they were dealing with some of the issues of the day. So some of the students talked about a particular um, strike that was going on in uh, the national utility here in Ireland, in, in um, Osair and, and they performed a, a presentation which was uh, a replication of a very popular radio show, The Live Line. And 
they had uh, people standing up in the audience, uh, students standing up in the in the lecture room, um, inverted commas, phoning in uh, to the live line to talk about um, their complaints or their support in respect of the strike and talking about the stages of negotiation. And they brought us through the stages of negotiation using the vehicle of the of the um, of the radio show. Again, it was it was pure theater, but it was, there was such an adherence to the learning objectives that we were trying to achieve. It was uh, an impressive discipline. On the performative side, uh, I reached out to, to the Dean of Teaching and Learning, Alison Hood, in relation to how this might become interdisciplinary. And I visualized that we were going to talk about literature, um, perhaps even uh, Shakespeare or works of, of literature. And after about one second, she said, this is about music. And after about one further second, I realized she was right. And it led us to create a case study and research, which has resulted in a publication in Journal of Management Education last month. And that's been an interesting um, journey uh, in partnership. So it's interesting to talk about uh, some of the aspects of that case study. And the case study itself uh, it has been published in, in, uh, uh, and presented in various different uh, forms and has been uh, pretty well received and robustly discussed in those formats. So the additional element here was adding interdisciplinary to the performative. So the performative was there, but the interdisciplinary certainly brought it to a different level. Um, because it was trotting new ground, it was um, involving a department of music and uh, and business students, students from the School of Business, doing different modules. And the puzzle, of course, was to how this could actually um, serve the needs in terms of increased learning for our students, increased engagement, uh, enthusiasm for learning, um, and how this could, um, this could also meet the needs of their modules. So the collaboration, obviously, was two very different departments, and the number of students was uh, between the few years that we did it was uh, between 140 and 150 students working in mixed groups using an interdisciplinary approach. And people often ask the question, it's, how do you do it? Uh, how do you manage? Because um, that's quite, a, it's quite what they call a far interdisciplinary. It's interdisciplinary from two different disciplines, which are very far apart in a sense. And the literature gave us um, the answer to the puzzle, because the answer to the puzzle is to try and apply their thoughts and their questions to context. In other words, the key issues of our time. So the puzzle was then to how to uh, link the performative, the interdisciplinary, and to make sure that we were being faithful and authentic to the learning requirements uh, of the university at the same time. So this meant looking at things with different worldviews and fresh perspectives and performing them in class. And the performance in class was quite interesting. It was very engaging. Uh, it, it, was, it was memorable in the sense that it was usually quite dynamic, um, highly participatory in lots of ways, participatory intra the groups of the students, but participatory from the audience as well, who were engaged in a peer assessment of what was going on uh, in front of them. And it was impactful because People still talk about it. And in the reflective essays that we asked them to do afterwards, they spoke of how this had impacted them. Juice. Two of you are going to hear the music and two of you are going to be in complete silence. I'm a little bit nervous today because I'm singing. It's about real knowledge that will help you to apply yourself to the world and maybe even shape the world that you're in afterwards. I loved it. I think that was so brave and just really wonderful. One of my favorite images is this image of um, very happy students having finished their work and having um, received the acclaim of their, of their peers uh, in terms of the value having been brought to them, um, the learning being enacted in front of them. And 
And this is the way learning should be. Um, this is the way students should be. They should be that excited about what's going on in front of them. But to capture them, we always gave them engaging assignments. We always asked them questions which they would see as relevant. The students in the change management could see the relevance of a, a wonderful change agent like Bowie staying relevant for 50 years. And what could Bowie teach us? And the lengths they went to to present their performance um, in relation to this were, were quite considerable. That was really heartwarming. Dealing with important change issues from and performance issues in respect of gender equality. Um, and learning, really, really learning to show that not all organizations and not all sectors are the same. How far behind multinationals was, uh, was the music industry? How far, how absolutely far behind equality uh, that multinationals could really teach um, equality uh, quite the, the, and the, the students bringing what they saw were very obvious um, blind auditions. Uh, suggestions about really innovative ways to reduce bias in organizations. So that was a really a, a, a mind opener. And how human motivation in terms of change. Students trying to explain to us um, through the medium of music and history how we can motivate ourselves when everybody says what we're trying to do is impossible. How do we motivate ourselves? How do we keep ourselves on track? And students trying to wrestle with the issue of change and trying to help people understand. And, and yet, at the same time, being in the middle of a change, um, a change, very changed role themselves. And towards the end of the, of the module, students, uh, as part of their assessment, were asked to reflect on what they'd learned and to, to see themselves as people who had just gone through a change experience and who had to perform that um, in front of their peers and to reflect on that. Um, and as I constantly reminded them, as people who will be managers in the future and who will manage other people and who will facilitate change and invite people to be part of change and how that should affect them because of this experience. So what were the outcomes? And the outcomes were quite interesting. Um, I think it's universally agreed in the literature and certainly from our experience that, you, that the, um, the response of students is, is and should be um, almost unanimously positive. It's, it's quite a different experience to the experience that um, try to, a different experience to, to um, to the, the PowerPoint lecture. And it should be different. Uh, that level of engagement and that level of seeding of control and that level of, of liberation and autonomy should actually change people's reaction to their experience. Outcomes that were less surprising is how, how well they acknowledge their teaching role. And this was a real um, bonus that the students uh, never lost sight of the fact that what they were trying, now they were helped by rubrics, but they never lost sight of the fact that their job was to, was to teach, was to add value, as they say, to the class. And that it wasn't a skit or it wasn't a sketch. It was, the purpose of it was to teach and for others to learn. The other striking thing was, uh, and I've always been, uh, I suppose anti would be, would, yeah, well, it wouldn't be too strong a word, anti the group essay. Um, understanding as they do the way students tend, to, groups tend to react to student essays, uh, to group essays and divide them. And, and, and there is no integrated learning or very little integrated learning. And crafting an assessment like this and crafting a, um, a process like this, which demanded that everybody be on message in the group, paying attention, integrated, uh, complementary to each other, um, was a complete antidote to the, the division of work in that sense. 
The students who were, were not performing were, were, were also another pleasant surprise. They, their engagement in, 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 the, um, in the performances by others, the way they, they found them to be interactive and the way the groups who didn't stay at the front of the room, who actually in, in, invited the audience to be part of what they were doing and saw that as a major part of, of their, their, their role to keep them engaged and to keep them involved was another bone, a total bonus, and uh, uh, but perhaps not not such a surprise. In subsequent uh, focus groups, we asked quite a lot about skill development. We asked how the students found they were they were, and we we found some really moving moments in relation to um, what the students had experienced. Um, particularly in, in the interdisciplinary side in terms of listening and empathy, but also um, the idea behind um, having to collaborate and cooperate with, with individuals and really finding it necessary to listen very hard and to be empathetic towards others. And, and also learning the skills of negotiation, because one of the things we found that if you do reach out to students and offer control, it will be grasped. and. Uh, it will be facilitate. It will facilitate a negotiation, and students are notoriously skillful at negotiation, and the development of confidence, as the next clip talks about, um, from students, which we heard repeated over and over again in our uh, in our focus groups. I remember at the start of the semester, I was kind of in between modules, and I was like, nope, I refuse to do the two with role plays because I don't like things like yes. that. I was like, and they're going to be big groups, no. And I think now I work in like a financial institution and kind of, I when I first started, I thought I was really quiet. But now because I have had the confidence to speak up in my groups, like in the past few weeks, one of them was like, oh, where did this come from? Like yeah. you're voicing everything. And I'm like, well, I've had to do it for the past 12 weeks. And I feel comfortable now with my thoughts that I can just say it. And if you don't like what I say, that's fine. And I respect that you don't agree with what I have to say. I think there was a lot of personal development and it, it was quite interesting um, to hear some students who are really quiet and who who came out of themselves in a sense dreading the module at first and then coming to find it as a real developmental experience the other outcome was uh, how it changed us in a way in terms of collaboration it seemed pointless to actually leave students waiting for uh, for a month for feedback in terms of their performances, they put so much work in. So feedback was instantaneous the minute it happened and their colleagues in the room were set the task of, of the peer assessment. So the whole room was working at the same time. But this was a very interesting um, feature of the whole uh, initiative that from the very start in terms of discussing the, the criteria for assessment, right through to the freedom to design what they would design, the freedom to negotiate the questions and assessments they were uh, they were there to uh, enact, and engaged in conversation afterwards in terms of what I had drawn and what we had drawn from their performance, and being able to explain and explore what they had done, um, changed the borders a little bit, moved moved the alignment a little bit, so. Uh, it certainly wasn't uh, a distant reading of a, an essay and the essay grade going back to the student and no other contact. Very, very different. Are there issues? Sure. Um, I, there is a question really about why. Uh, if something has been really popular uh, uh, and became an innovation in the 1960s, but is now a methodological given, a path well trodden, why does it not happen in disciplines other than business? Um, my question and disciplines other than music, um, Alison Hood's question. A mystery in red, in some ways it's understandable because performance is quite a pejorative word in, um, in, in academia in a sense. And even though there's traction, definite traction in some, in some disciplines in relation to it, but still there's a, there's a discussion to be had there. There is the issue of, of uh, the shadow side, as I referred to earlier, and Clancy um, 
is mentioned here in, re in relation to the control and the help of anxiety and experiential learning. And I think that's the way experiential learning has been interpreted. And we're using controls uh, in, highly, in high control situations, but which are not, not supportive enough of students. And the only way to support students is to support them in a sense, but, but to support them with their confidence. Um, and one of the comments that's in that slide there is learning experience allowed us as students to have more control over our learning. It came back again and again. Um, that, that it reminded me back of, of, of my experience as a manager that the more I tried to control things, the less I controlled them. And the, the, the calibration of that uh, responsibility, um, uh, motivation of human beings, um, discipline, uh, really giving um, individuals the opportunity to develop with the freedom to do it and the, the support to do it, uh, it transformed their performance. And it moved us away, it moved, it certainly did move us away from being the sage on the stage, um, is, which is a common expression in the, in the education literature. And it queried our role as being authority figures in the, in the lecture room. One thing that's a little bit counterintuitive is that the literature through Gilbert here suggested that there was a huge time consumption in respect of, um, of performance in the classroom. And this is the opposite to what we found. Gilbert as asserts that there's a huge uh, preparation time, but I think that's to miss the point. I think that the point was to give the responsibility to the students and to give the control to the students and then to step back and get out of the way. And every time I arrived at the classroom, every time uh, Alison arrived at the classroom, we were, we were met with students who had already prepared, who uh, were not waiting to be told uh, what to do, which were not waiting to move furniture or bring uh, equipment or materials in that they needed. They, they had done all this. We were not playing, we were not, uh, asked for any support in terms of finance for materials or anything like that. The students took on all of that. And of course, that's what you would expect in a sense, um, even though the literature is saying um, that it's time consuming. It may be time consuming for the students, but they take it on willingly. So what's going on in, in, in uh, the future and what uh, this usual, this typical thing that we do as, 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 um, as academics, we delegate all the hard work to other other researchers who, who follow us, but I think there's a, there's a student engagement, there's a part of student engagement here that really needs to be examined in terms of how a performative approach can make a difference to uh, the engagement of, of students. It can be done in high enrollment classes. That's not, that to me is not a debate anymore. Um, so what are the true effects? Can we get empirical evidence? Can we use the tools that we have? We're, we're, very, um, we're very experienced at using tools for evaluating uh, learning. We should use these tools to help us understand the contribution of, of learning activities uh, in classroom. And what are the implications for management uh, researchers and teachers? And I think what uh, the implications to me are um, that what's going on in, in these performances, they, they replicate some of the issues of control in the workplace. Um, and it blurs the, the borders. I remember Joe Hearn, the wonderful American student who was with us, who, who drew my attention to this um, in discussion about how there's a, there's a moment where seemingly um, that I have seeded the classroom. He says, you let it go and then you take it back really quickly because you have a discipline that, and, and there's this loose tight. And to have a student explain the concept of loose tight um, to you in these ways was really uh, inspiring in a way. Um, we, we probably have to look at our, our role and our practice as experts and, and that's our safety. Um, is it our safety? Is it our comfort blanket? And to me, with like with Joe O'Hearn, the opportunities for dialogue with students around management themes are presented to us. 
in the classroom as a very near, a very immediate, very exciting opportunity. So talking about real stuff that's happening now. And, and these things aren't typically available in arm's length case study materials, which can be seen as distant, um, of it from a different culture and not immediate in case study materials that students find in textbooks. So um, appreciate that uh, very much indeed. Uh, would love to hear some questions in the chat if that's, uh, that's possible. And uh, maybe we listen to that. If you have a question, maybe you could uh, write in the chat uh, what that question might be. I'll hand it back to Peter. Thanks, Paul. So work away with the questions in the chat or, or we've hands up there from Christina as her hand up first. So maybe Christina could ask a question first. Um, thanks, Paul. Um, myself and Paul um, have had great debates over the years in relation to uh, different teaching styles. I still contest, Paul, that we um, can't give up uh, totally on the fact that we're going to prepare our students for uh, the real world. I know you're talking about the citizenship side, but I still strive to make sure that we do something in our classes that are directly so my linked, um, obviously on a practical nature to, to the real world. Yes, skills are certainly uh, underpinning everything, but look, I totally agree with everything. And I think uh, what you do has been aspirational for all of us. And I only wish that, <laughs> that I could do as much as what you're gonna do, but even if I take 5% of what you've achieved over the last couple of years with your students, then I will be very happy. So thank you. Thanks indeed. Uh, thanks indeed, Christina. And I think it's and and, it's not either or. I think it's it's very much and and. Thank you very much for that, appreciate it. We have a question there, Paul, from, uh, from Nick Lamanford, just wondering, uh, how this is translated into remote teaching scenarios in recent times? Shockingly, um, the, the students were uh, were adamant. Some of the groups were adamant that they wanted to continue um, into the pivot, and that was a, another surprise for me. So I, I removed, I removed the, um, uh, the in discussion with Alison, we said we we removed the once we go to pivot, we remove the requirement, obviously. Uh, for people to be performative, whereas we got a couple of groups coming back to us to say, no, 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 stop that. That's uh, that's we we need the option to be that. And we we had a wonderful uh, rendition of "Ode to Joy," which I think we all need to hear every now and again mm. by by students in the in their lockdown as a means of um, re-energizing themselves when they were locked at home, and we probably need to take care of our students as much as possible in our pastoral roles. But um, that's a great question, Nicola. Um, and we removed the, the requirement, um, but it wasn't met with unanimity. There, some groups weren't happy because they'd, they, once you set people a, a challenge and they accepted the challenge, um, it's, it's, it's a perverse thing about us as humans. When you re remove the responsibility, they sometimes get upset. Um, they've missed the opportunity. Has to be thought through though, um, because there's an issue of uh, distancing, really important, and we need to keep we need to keep people safe. We've got a question there, uh, Paul from Alga, followed then by Stefan. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Paul, for this presentation and for all our wonderful conversations, stimulating conversations over the years. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with when you retire, to be honest. Uh, quick question uh, in relation to the, I don't know, is, is it related to performative element or something else? We usually tend to uh, avoid uh, spending lots of time on students presenting their projects because we've we found, uh, Personally, I found that other groups tend to find this uh, boring and they disengage. Clearly, this is not what happened with you. Is it the fact that you had this unique uh, collaboration with music? Is it that just the uh, tasks that we give our students are not interesting enough for the entire class to be interested in listening to other groups? Uh, thank you, Olga, and a, a really important question that we we'd gone through, and I went through this for five years. Um, yes, I absolutely believe, but but one of the things I learned from, from um, and funny enough, I learned this from 
at training people in presentation skills in corporate settings is that when the person, when one person is practicing, what task are you giving everyone else? And uh, when we set up the, um, myself and my colleague, I think he's on the call, John Townsend, when we set up the Master Trainer Institute in Geneva, one of the things that, that actually happened in part when people were presenting, but everybody in the room had a task that they could be called on to talk about uh, immediately after the presentation. And we took that straight forward, that it's, its behavior is really a function of its consequences, that, that if people are sitting there apathetic and, and asleep and semi-conscious, it's because we have mandated that. I think it's our responsibility. So just to answer your question directly, um, all groups at the end of the performance were required to buzz. They were required to make a, a, uh, a, a decision on how effective using the rubric, how effective the presentation had been, and to summarize what they thought of the presentation, because each of the performing groups got the opportunity to call on a group to verbally tell them how they did. And they, they had to give them something that they did well, and they had to give them something that they needed to do even better the next time. So you're absolutely right. Students will sit there, and if, if that's what we reward, if we reward something else, they will completely change their behavior and the debates at the end of it. And some people were even arguing, you're not being critical enough. You know, you're, you're, you're being too nice. And, and uh, that was interesting. And I too, I'll, I'll definitely miss our conversations. That's, uh, but why should we stop them? I mean, we can, we can have we shouldn't. them in the future. We shouldn't. We shouldn't. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Olga. Step back. Hi, Paul. Um, thank you very Hi. much for a great presentation. Chimes with my heart and my own practice over many years in terms of desire to use experiential learning. And um, but one of the questions that's continually emerging for me is I call them the five percent. Um, it strikes me that there are five percent of learners who experience significant shadow sides during experiential work. And it's starting to appear in the literature. There have been some articles over the last couple of years around those learners who find it even damaging psychologically to be put on the spot, to be asked to perform, to participate even in group work. And with the growing concerns around mental health of learners, whether they be young people, 18, say, to 21, 22, or whether they are adult learners, there's some interesting in issues emerging for us as practitioners, as teachers. I've had to do several sort of pastoral pieces with people after what seemed to me to be quite straightforward and even mundane performance act type of activities compared to the, the, the wonderful ones you've done. Um, any thoughts on that and whether or not those 5% actually, yeah, might hinder us taking forward, um, learning more about how to, to engage performatively in um, learning? I, I, I think that's a great question. I think there's a PhD in what you asked. Um, no, there and, is, yeah. And, and can I tell you that, the, Stefan, the, my first reaction is that, uh, in all, and, and I learned this from the corporate world, that nobody, there is nothing mandatory for anybody. I'm not going to control anybody in the sense that I'm just going to say that you have to do this. That's a, you know, absolutely. I also have um, I introduced a practice um, that if you were a member of the group, you attracted the award for the group. In other words, the grade for the group, come hell or high water, you attracted that. So there was no, you, you didn't have to show up scared or anxious or just because you were trying to pass your degree. That wasn't fair. So, and it would often happen that people would be ill or uh, would cry off or, and I said, use them in whatever, use people in whatever way you want and allow people to be used in whatever way they want to be used. And don't push any further than people are comfortable doing. Uh, don't give them tasks and roles. Sometimes people who were going through anxiety took a role of sitting in the audience um, and doing something fairly basic. Um, sometimes they sat and did nothing uh, because that was they were allowed to do that. I, I think you've raised a very important point that we have a, 
we have a duty of care and and I took this from my employment uh, in, as a manager that, you know, we're like doctors, I think, first do no harm. Uh, and, and so what you've, what, you've, what you've pointed out is a really uh, important question, but we need not stop because of it. Uh, and it, is, it has been found, it hasn't been, how should I say, nothing has been brought to my attention that anyone has been harmed in that sense. So I'm, I'm quite happy about that. But I do think we have to give them the freedom not to be there. Yes, strong point. Thank you, Stefan. Are there any other questions, folks? I don't see any hands up there. Perhaps there is in the chat. Uh, There's loads in the chat, Peter. So maybe, Paul, if you have a look at the chat and pick which ones you'd prefer to respond to in the time. I before. love that. I love that, Peter. That's. That's a that's exactly what you need to do is you need to filter out the ones that you can't answer. Very, very important. Um, so there's a couple of nice things there. Uh, Gareth, I remember Gareth really well. Uh, and that's very, very decent of you to say that, Gareth. Um, Kieran, thank you. Great presentation, lovely. Um, very nice, thank you for that. Interesting point, Jean. Bowie, Dr. Hall's layouts, fix seating, do not facilitate. I think you're right, Michael, they don't facilitate it. But, you know, leave the problem to the students. I think leave the problem. The student will, will actually, um, they will actually solve the problem. Uh, and, and quite often, I think that's where Gilbert, I think, went wrong uh, in trying to do all the things for the student. In fact, it's like any parent knows that you can actually remove people's responsibility by doing too much for, for children and by doing too much for workers in a sense and doing too much for students. Um, I think that's really important. Uh, let's go back. Jean, uh, how do you deal with students who are not ready to take some control? I find sometimes students want lectures to provide a really to find out, but when we tell them to get to the front end. I, I agree. I think it's, 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 but some of them are like calves in the farm in, in springtime, getting out and they go mad, they kick and they, and, and that's probably the norm, as opposed to people who don't want to control. But it's, it's also really, there's a certain go with the flow that peer, peer pressure and peer example is really uh, very strong. And that if the groups are large enough, this is another point going back to Stefan, uh, and I'm a believer in large groups. If the groups are large enough, there's plenty of, of, of opportunity for people to take on roles which are less arduous and demanding. But also there's a, uh, it's very hard when, when something gives you joy. I mean, I, I think setting the tasks, would I be interested in doing most of the tasks that I set my students is a question I ask. Would I actually be interested in them? Or would I get lots of joy out of them? And I don't mean just would I be only interested, but I get joy out of this. And if if I would get joy, then there's there's an easy chance that uh, maybe all our, all of my students will will feel the same way about it. I definitely think uh, my instinct is not anymore to 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 apply pressure to people to do things. I really think that that's that would be teaching them the wrong lesson. Um, so thanks indeed for that. Um, it, it, Nicholas' question about remote teaching is really important. I, I don't necessarily think I have the solution for it, but I think um, I'm sure my students will actually solve it for me at some stage. So uh, I think that's really cleaned it out. I hope, um, I hope that's, uh, that's helped a lot for people uh, just learning about the case study. Thanks indeed to Alison Hood, who was a great buddy and a great partner in this. And thank you to all my colleagues in the in the school for jousting with me at times and for putting up with my nonsense in the kitchen um, where everything has to be kept secret no matter what you say. So I'm much obliged to you all and thank you Peter for the opportunity today to do this farewell lecture and thank you to the school as well for this opportunity. It's been, it's been really, I thought I was scared of it but I think it's been a great experience. Thank you very much indeed. And, and thank you Paul for all your service. It's very much appreciated. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, now
Go back out there and earn my pension for me, please. Go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so Thank much, you. Paul. Here. Thank you, Paul. Great presentation. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Paul, good luck in your next chapter. Thanks a lot, very much indeed. Thank you. Really appreciate Thanks, it. Paul. Thank you, Paul. Well Thank done. you, Paul. Thanks a lot. Stay well. Thank you. Bye. Guys. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Well done, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> bye, Al. <laughs>